Hello everyone. This is one of my videos from AirVenture 2021. During AirVenture, I had the chance to sit down with Ed Collin from CamGuard and I learned a lot about oil and oil additives. A lot of things I didn't know before or only knew uh, superficially. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Fair warning, it was a little noisy that morning. So we had uh, a lot of noise from airplanes and helicopters flying overhead because, well, it was AirVenture. Here we go. Hello everyone, it's AirVenture 2021. We're all glad to be back here. And this morning I have the pleasure of sitting with uh, Ed Collin from CamGuard, a gentleman who knows more about engine oils than, uh, than most of us do. Um, Mr. Collin, thank you for joining me here today. Uh, maybe we'll start with a brief introduction. Uh, I'm curious where you grew up and, and where, when and how in your life you became so interested in engine lubricants, which ultimately led you to where you are today. Well, thank you for, for allowing me this opportunity. Um, I grew up in Detroit and uh, was a gearhead since I could walk. Mm -hmm. So I took apart cars, I took apart everything, and uh, much to my parents' dismay. Um, but. I ended up, after college, I went right to work for General Motors Research and very interested in um, chemistry of, of fuels, lubricants, and uh, how the engines uh, worked with them and how they affected performance. Um, I got hired away from General Motors by Exxon Research. Uh, after working there for five years and uh, went out to New Jersey uh, and was there for uh, 20 years where I ran, I developed and uh, ran the engine laboratory at Corporate Research uh, in the Advanced Fuel and Lubricants Group. Mm -hmm. So I had um, an entire playground. I mean, I had a wonderful uh, facility, uh, had tremendous budgets and um, a lot of freedom to, to experiment and, and, and test and develop new additives and um, formulations and such. So it's, it, it was a, really a dream job for me um, to have this. Um, a, an acquaintance, a friend of mine who worked for an affiliate company at Exxon asked me if I would be interested in uh, working on Exxon's brand new piston aviation oil. Mm -hmm. Didn't have a name. Became the elite. And I said, sure. I mean, I, I'm a plane owner, a pilot, and um, I'd love to work on that. And uh, I did the initial research on, on that product, did the initial marketing study on the product, um, and uh, presented Exxon USA with the formulation for that product. Uh, they looked at it, said it was nice, said it was way too expensive, way too exotic, and thank you very much. <laughs> they uh, went on to copy the AeroShell uh, product uh, with a few minor tweaks uh, that could be used for marketing purposes, but um, it was a uh, uh, a good oil, um, not w what I would have done, but um, so during that uh, that research period, I went around to different shops and, 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 and different companies. So I, I went to Continental, I went to Lycoming, and um, different engine shops, and everybody told me that I needed to go down to aircraft specialty services. Mm -hmm. They see more parts, steel parts, than anybody else in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I called Greg Merrill, uh, the owner, and um, explained that I was working on the, the new piston aviation oil for Exxon. And uh, could I come down and see him, look at parts, and talk to him about his uh, impressions and his uh, uh, opinions about what would be needed in that oil? or a oil and 
he invited me down for a weekend and we looked at lots of parts and had, uh, had a great time together. We became uh, uh, good friends at that point. And um, we looked at probably a thousand parts over the weekend. And I, I know that he was shocked. Um, I was surprised. He was shocked because he sees these parts every day. But when 90 plus percent of the red tag parts were inspected, it was discovered that corrosion, rust, um, was responsible for uh, the fact that that was now a red tag part and was, had failed mm -hmm. and could not be resurrected. So um, I, I took that uh, information back to, to Exxon and that, that's where I um, uh, put together my formulation when, and, and rust protection was like number one, two, and three out of 10 for importance um, to make sure that, that I had that covered. Um, other uh, aspects were um, cleanliness, uh, anti-wear, um, everybody uh, knows that Airplane engines you know, leak a lot of oil and such, so, so I, I wanted to see if I could address that with uh, seal conditioners and, and uh, keep the engines dry. So um, when Exxon decided to go uh, with the uh, AeroShell clone, uh, Greg asked me um, if I could produce something for general aviation as an adder. Yes, sure. <laughs> and so uh, I, I produced it and we, we all used it um, for uh, four or five years um, in, the, in, in the late 90s and um, very successfully and everybody was quite happy with it. Um, and then in 2001, I just left Exxon to, to go off as a consultant and uh, Greg asked me if I wanted to commercialize the product. I said, yeah, that, that would be great, um, but I felt more comfortable reformulating it so I didn't use any of the technical information or additives that I had de developed for the Exxon Elite. Sure, yeah. So just to be on the safe side, so I, I took a year um, to develop CamGuard. Um, it actually worked out really well because some of the additives I had chosen for the Elite were no longer available and um, I found other additives that were uh, higher performance for what I was trying to achieve. So it wor worked out really, really well and uh, we started selling it here at Oshkosh um, in 2001, uh, we uh, went into a tent out here um, uh, with a friend of Greg's and uh, just sort of set up a table and, and talked to people that, that came into the tent and had a little poster outside. And some people came in and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd talk to them for an hour and maybe they'd buy a bottle or maybe mm -hmm. not, but it was just an introduction. Yeah. And then uh, the following year, Greg um, bought um, booths inside the, uh, one of the buildings and uh, uh, set up a booth for aircraft specialties and cam guard. So we had double booth and, and uh, th that was really the first exposure um, to the main crowd uh, of our product. And, uh, you know, talked to people for a half an hour or 60 minutes and maybe sell them a bottle, um, maybe a four pack, but um, it was a lot of education. And, um, but people were really, really interested um, because they realized I, I kind of knew what I was talking about and uh, had the, the credentials to, to, to justify and, uh, what, what we were doing. Fascinating. Um, I, which, which leads me to my next question. I'm, an, I'm a pilot, I'm an aircraft owner, I fly a Bonanza with an IO550. 
I know I need oil in my engine. I don't need to change the oil. I know oil temperature is supposed to be in a certain range. But I really don't know much about how oil does what it does and what as a pilot and aircraft owner I can do to, to help the oil get the job done. Can you maybe talk a little bit about you know, what, what, what are the objectives, the, what, the purposes of oil inside the, the engine? Sure. And um, maybe from a pilot's perspective or aircraft owner's perspective? Okay. Um, first, I'll, I'll be a little more technical. Uh, just what, do, what does oil do in the engine? So it lubricates. Um, and there's different kinds of lubrication. There's film lubrication where the parts don't actually touch, but the rides on, um, are separated by an oil film um, uh, called uh, the hydrodynamic is the technical term for it. Um, then you have uh, metal to metal uh, contact and, and you need to lubricate that uh, interface. Um, and that's a, a cam and lifter, uh, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's referred to uh, boundary lubrication. Um, oh, let me say the hydrodynamic lubrication uh, is found in main bearings, uh, rod bearings, um, and uh, journals. And uh, then you, there are certain areas, uh, cylinders, for example, sort of run between the two and, and, and hit both uh, as the pistons go up and down. The, the piston rings uh, uh, move fast and then they stop and then reverse direction. So the, the, the regime changes um, every stroke. Right. Um, the, the next uh, really important aspect, particularly in our air, aircraft engines, is um, that's the mechanism by which heat is drawn out of the engine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it goes into the oil, um, it's splashed on the back sides of the pistons, which are well over 400 degrees, and uh, it, 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 it uh, is absorbed into the oil. And then the oil is pumped and goes through an oil cooler, so it releases that, uh, that heat to the air. Um, and, and, and keeps the engine alive. Um, uh, the next thing it does is um, it suspends contaminants. And that's where aircraft engines vary dramatically from their other spark ignition counterparts, the car engines, the boat engines, and whatnot. Um, I refer to aircraft engines as contamination limited. So that's the real reason we, we change oil in uh, uh, aircraft engines, not because the oil breaks down, but because it is so contaminated. And it's contaminated with um, what is called blow-by. Blow-by is that gas that squirts by the piston rings um, during the compression and power stroke uh, of each four stroke cycle. So if you have um, a, a, a Continental uh, 550 that's burning maybe 14, 15 gallons per hour, um, you realize that your engine puts six, eight, ten ounces of fuel into the oil every hour. Mm -hmm. That's a tremendous amount of stuff. Just yeah. think about that. So a quart's 32 ounces, but every hour you're putting another eight ounces of liquid junk into your oil. And I assume that's for a good engine with, with that's the working good. rings that... Correct. Okay. Yeah. So that's a lot of contamination. Yes. Most of it goes right out the breather. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't cause any harm. But there's a small amount of it that's partially reacted. Um, and I can go through that process. I'm not sure it's really necessary. It's available on our website, uh, videos of, of this process. Um, that uh, the, the, the combusting fuel, um, the reactive fuel that gets um, forced into the crankcase continues to react in the crankcase and does not go out the breather, that stuff, and it's only, we're talking thimblefuls of, 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 of fuel, 
um, that causes virtually all the problems in general aviation aircraft. Oh. It causes the, the uh, acids um, that acidify the water that's in there that, that promotes corrosion. It, it is responsible for virtually all the deposits that we see in the engines. So that stuff is really, really terrible. Um, the last thing um, that the oil uh, is responsible for is um, keeping the seals, in, uh, which keep the oil in the engine. So it protects the seals and lubricates the seals so they can do their sealing job and, and keeping, uh, keeping the oil uh, where it belongs on the inside the engine as opposed to letting it leak out. Um, so those are the four uh, properties of oil. Um, and it does that in every engine, but it's, it, it, it's a little bit different um, for an aircraft engine because of the, the heat aspect is so much more important. Than, than and I, and I, if I understood you correctly, you mentioned that the uh, contaminants, that that is something that is particularly um, bad with the aircraft engines. How, how are automotive engines different? Uh, do, do they have the same problem or if, if not, why not? Yeah, autom automotive engines um, do not have that same problem. Um, the reason that uh, aircraft engines do have that problem is because they are air-cooled and air-cooled engines, the parts are, have to um, uh, operate over a very wide temperature range. Mm -hmm. They have different materials, they have steel and aluminum. So when you're combining different materials and an engine that uh, is not temperature controlled, you have to build in um, a, a lot of clearances to protect uh, the, um, for example, the piston, uh, if it, the aluminum piston grows too much with heat and the steel cylinder doesn't, if you don't have enough clearance, it gets trapped and captured by the, by the cylinder. Yeah. So you, you have to make that um, uh, loose enough that it works, but as you make it looser, you, you, you allow more contamination mm -hmm. into the oil. Okay. So if you were to look at, and it, again, this is on our website also, we have a cutaway of a uh, lycoming, and it was compliments of lycoming to let us use this. Um, lycoming piston cylinder and the cutaway cylinder with the piston at the bottom dead center, it almost planks around, it's so loose. Um, and then with the choke and the taper in the cylinder, um, it tightens up, but at, at uh, room temperature or below, there's huge amounts of clearance and then the, it tightens up as, as the engine warms up. So that's the, the biggest um, uh, difference between an automotive engine and an aircraft engine. Automotive engines, they're water-cooled, much more tight, um, uh, tightly controlled temperatures. By having that temperature control, you can um, tighten up all of the uh, clearances and uh, the tolerances for both engines might be the same, but the clearances are, are dramatically different. You know? that, that makes sense, and that intuitively makes it clear to me why oil changes are so important, because all these contaminants end up in the oil, and I bet at some point the capacity for the oil to absorb more is reached, and then it has to be changed. Is that how I should think about it? Exactly, and, 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 and you've used exactly the right term because people talk about synthetic base oils or synthetic oils and the synthetic oils that that we're exposed to in aviation and cars is only one small aspect of uh, one small one type of synthetic oil there are lots of synthetic oils and We've had problems with synthetic oils in aircraft use because they're the wrong synthetic base stocks, mm -hmm. the wrong synthetic oils. They cannot withstand any contamination. Okay. That's the problem. Mineral base stocks tolerate and, 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 and help the dispersant 
keep all this contamination in suspension, whereas the synthetic oils can't. People think, oh, it's the lead particles, lead bromide particles that the problem. No, it's the fuel components that's the problem. Once the dispersant is used up, because the dispersant's job, its only job is to grab onto um, com partially combusted uh, fuel molecules in the oil, the contaminants that get in the oil, and grab onto them, hold them in suspension until you drain the oil. Mm -hmm. It doesn't grab dirt, it doesn't grab metal particles, it doesn't grab it doesn't interfere with the uh, break-in. It doesn't, it doesn't really interact with the metal uh, very much. Um, its only job is to, to, to go after these, these um, partially reacted uh, fuel molecules. Okay, yeah. uh, or oil molecules in the case of car engines, because car engines uh, go very uh, much longer uh, oil change intervals right. than, than, than aircraft. As a pilot, I've also heard that oil temperature is, is important. Uh, I understand it needs to have, it needs to be warm enough so that water can, uh, we, we can get rid of water. Uh, I, I don't understand exactly how that process works, so maybe there's more to it than, than, than simply boiling it out. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? And uh, sure. what is, is, is there something that's too hot, too cold? What, what's a good range to run in? We have oil temperature gauges in our, our aircraft, uh, but there are lots of oil temperatures um, depending on where you do that measurement. Mm -hmm. So if you measured in the sump, it'll be one temperature. If you measure it uh, at the output of the oil cooler, it'll be considerably lower. Right. Yeah. Um, at the input of the oil cooler, it'll be 25, 50, to 35 degrees hotter. So it's important to understand where the temperature is measured in the system. Absolutely, uh, and once you know where it is, it's really consistency is what you're looking for. Um, the oil temperature determines how much water will be dissolved, actually dissolved in the oil. So it reaches an equilibrium depending on the overall average temperature of that oil. Mm -hmm. Remember I said that the undersides of the piston are over you know, 400 to 450 degrees. Well, water hits that and it flashes right away. Right. Well, you don't have to run very long um, to flash off all that water, except the water has to travel through the rest of the engine mm -hmm. and hit cold metal parts where it condenses again, goes back into the oil. Mm -hmm. So um, you have to get up and fly your aircraft, let it reach equilibrium, and that will minimize for your aircraft, every aircraft, the amount of water in the crankcase and, and the oil, the, the water that's dissolved in that oil. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the numbers um, can be a little tricky, again, because of the location of the oil temperature probe, but you, you'd like to see your oil temperature average um, 180 to, to 210. Oil temperatures below that, the, 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 the water equilibrium is too high and um, we, we tend to see more corrosion. And that's uh, in Fahrenheit? Or yes. 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 Um, and uh, oil temperatures uh, much above 220 degrees is, a, is a approaching red line uh, for most uh, manufacturers and um, you start to see uh, decreases in um, viscosity which is reflected by oil pressure mm -hmm. so you know and you can actually um, observe this every flight you can see your oil temperature change with your slightly increase in, in, in oil temperature. Right. So, um, it's, which is just something to keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. the, the green arc or the, the green area 
um, for most uh, aircraft uh, seems to be about 180 to, 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 to 210, 215 uh, range. Okay. When I fly in the winter, I usually have trouble to get it to that range. Uh, and I, I heard, I've, I've not done this myself, I heard some people use tape to partially block off the, the air inlet of the oil cooler. Do yep. you think that's a good idea? Um, depending on how cool you you can, some aircraft have have uh, oil oil cooler doors that they can open and close, like cowl flaps. Um, those are very handy. Other people um, have kits that they put on um, winterization kits that uh, basically are something. Uh, 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 a piece of metal, sheet metal that blocks the uh, all uh, or part of the oil cooler, but bolted in place, it's, it's very nicely done. Um, and then the rest of us uh, that 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 do uh, make some changes, yeah, we go to the aviation department of Home Depot and and uh, get the, some aluminum tape and, yeah. uh, and and tape off part of the oil cooler mm -hmm. uh, to um, uh, to keep our oil temperatures up. And that gets dropped down here. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Another tip that I've heard, uh, curious if you, have, if you have an opinion, is that after each flight, I should remove the oil filler cap and dipstick and allow water vapor to escape while the engine is still hot. Is is that a good idea with corrosion in mind? Anything that helps get the water out of the crankcase is a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, how much water? You know, if you, you do that, you, I take my dipstick out and I take my oil cap off. Um, the oil cap is an uh, inch and a half diameter, so you see some vapor coming off of that. And I put a piece of cold metal over that one time to see how much water it was. And uh, it was quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, was it a couple milliliters? Uh, I don't know uh, if it was that much, but. Um, Getting it out is, is important, um, and uh, I, 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 I always see it out of both the, the uh, oil uh, dipstick tube and the, the oil fill tube, so I, I do it routinely and leave the doors open until I'm getting ready to leave the airport and then close it again. Okay. Changing gears just a little bit, when, when I get fuel, I, I, I care about how much it costs, of course, but I. I, I never pay attention to where it comes from, which 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 company are, are there differences, and in particular with the news that we heard here recently on unleaded fuel, is is there something that we should know as aircraft owners that um, in the context of our conversation? Well, with regards to um, leaded avgas, uh, there are only a few manufacturers, and uh, they're held to a very tight specification and um, I've only seen a few problems caused by incorrectly made fuel and and those were corrosion issues um, the pistons turned to white fluff um, but that was unusual and it's only been two times in 30 years. That was so, a quality control issue? Yeah. Okay. Exactly, the, the lead scavenger mm. problem. Um, as far as the, 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 the new um, unleaded fuel, Avgas, I, I uh, assisted in that development. I was a, a technical assistant to, to George Brawley and the Gamby people. Um, I've talked to them for several years um, uh, about fuels and, and, and what they were, they were trying to do and help them in any, any way that I could. And um, I, I, I'm thrilled that they finally got the FAA to, to, to realize what they were doing and, and, and what they did. And, um, and and approve it, and uh, now we're going through the SDC process. But um, as far as I know and what I've seen, there is no downside 
at all to using that kind of fuel. Um, what's the price point going to be? I, I have no idea. Uh, we'll just have to see, uh, you know, how things develop and, you know, hopefully it'll be about the same price. Might be a little bit more, especially initially, but, you know, that's it's so exciting because um, the effect that that will have on the engines, the maintenance, um, the oil, uh, they're all, all, all very positive. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward mm -hmm. to that. And of course, we cannot end this conversation without talking a little bit about the uh, product that you invented, formulated CamGuard. Uh, we, we all know a little more about what, what oil is supposed to do now. Uh, how, how does CamGuard help? What problems can I avoid? Yeah, CamGuard um, can be thought of as the additive package that should be in the oil. The um, FAA and uh, engine companies work very differently than any other engine manufacturer governing body um, for oils. Um, the FAA's uh, regulations are based on an old military specification that basically says use this thick stuff and as long as it doesn't do any harm, you're fine. Um, whereas car oils have to meet performance standards. Well, I, I was trained in, in, in car oil formulation, truck oil formulation, uh, marine engine formulation, and we always formulated for performance, um, to performance specifications. And you can just pass the specification or you can wildly pass the specification. Depends how much money you want to spend. Either way you pass and you get the, the Yeah, mark. So, so if you're in a competitive field, you go for the just pass to, to stay competitive. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a high performance, um, want high performance products, yeah, you're willing to pay that. And if you have the, the market um, and, and you can demonstrate the performance difference, um, it, it becomes a very, very easy sale. Um, CamGuard is uh, designed to do four things. One um, of those things, when the engine's not being used, it protects it from rust and corrosion. Mm -hmm. The other three is when you are using the engine, when you're flying. Um, so it protects your investment, whether you're flying or not. It protects against deposits, which are almost as hard on the engine as rust and corrosion, and, and cause a, a lot of a lot of premature um, uh, maintenance. Um, and are these deposits? Is that part of the um, uh, contaminants that you talked about earlier, or it all come they... from the contaminants? Mm -hmm. I had a small amount of contaminants that I, I described. Um, but where those deposits form are, are different. They can form in the ring zone. Mm -hmm. uh, it's primarily why large bore continentals suffer from premature um, loss of compressions, mm -hmm. starting anywhere from 400 hours. Um, and you can also have valve sticking problems. Mm -hmm. People see with small Lycomings, and he actually some larger Lycomings also in uh, Robinson helicopters come to mind. Um, they have to do the valve wobble test because of carbon, carbonaceous deposits in the valve guides, and, and, and so they drop the valve down a little bit and wiggle it back and forth. And if it doesn't wiggle, it's full of carbon. You have to drop the valve and ream the valve guide. So th those deposits can can cause, cause a lot of problems. You stick a valve. The valve uh, bends a push rod, you lose all your oil, you can lose your engine even worse. So, um, definitely a big problem. CamGuard has a very strong anti wear package. It's actually more effective than the zinc anti wear that are in car oils, although we don't use zinc. We don't use zinc in any of our products. 
it, it, it is anti-wear designed specifically for use in aircraft using aircraft oils. Um, the last thing is seal conditioning. I mentioned the seals before. Um, with time and temperature, seals tend to harden. First of all, they, they set and so they take on the, the dimensions that they're, they're allowed to and then they harden. And when they harden, um, they tend to weep a little oil. Um, the seal conditioners and cam guard prevent that hardening or if they are hardened, they recondition the seals to um, and put them back in their supple, um, soft, squishy um, conformation and um, continue to work as they're intended. Should cam guard be added um, along with an oil change or any time I, I add a little oil if it's low or what's, what's the best way to make sure I have the right amount of cam guard in the engine? Yes, cam guard, if it's thought of as the additive package, then you add 5% or 1.6 ounces per quart of oil at oil change. So the bottle, 16 ounce bottle, is that size, and I use that size because that fits my engine. Okay. <laughs> so, so it was, I put in nine quarts or nine and a half quarts of oil, one pint of cam guard brings me up to 10 quarts of oil. And then um, I, in a case of oil, uh, I'll have a couple of quarts left over. I take the tops off, fill up the dead air volume uh, on each quart, oh, yeah. fill it up with cam guard, put the caps back on, shake them up, mark CG, and throw them in the back of the plane, uh, stand them up in the back of the plane in case they leak. Um, but uh, I have uh, oil with cam guard makeup there Pretty when I need it. Yeah. So, and uh, I've actually given away quarts of oil to people that need it. And I say, well, it has cam guard in it. Oh, good, because I already use cam guard and I don't <laughs> have any. So. Yeah, that, that's a that's a very convenient point. Yeah, yeah, it makes it easy. Yes, we we all know that flying an airplane more hours per year is 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 good, right? Engines like to to operate. Planes don't like to sit on the ground. Uh, what what's a good, shall we say, minimum number of of hours that it, an engine should operate a year to uh, to protect its its value and uh, to to keep it healthy? And uh, what, what's your observation been of um, how, how pilots and aircraft owners actually reach or don't reach that number? Uh, the, there really isn't a number, uh, I'd say. It's more the frequency uh, of use uh, that, that, that I think is important. Uh, if you can fly, um, you know, every couple of weeks um, all year round, your, your engine, your plane and your engine in particular is, is going to benefit. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, life happens um, and people can't, can't fly and, and don't like to fly in the winter time and the planes are out and the ice and snow and, right. you know, it's just, that's the way it is. Um, so, yes, you want cam guard in there, you want to preheat, and I, I really want the uh, opportunity, appreciate the opportunity to talk to, to people about preheating their airplanes great idea except when they plug their heaters in 24 hours a day seven days a very week. very controversial topic very controversial and, yes. but aircraft specialties rebuild starter adapters on continentals and we will rebuild a lot of them most of them are the, the ones that come in all rusted are the ones that have been plugged in 24 7. so we have lots of proof demonstrating that, yes, you say that the engine's warm to the touch all the time, the blanket's on top, but how come your starter adapter is rusted? Yeah. Wh whatever the reason, it's from. You have the correlation that the, that, that happens to engines that are constantly yes. on a heater. Yes. And um, it does not happen when they're in heated hangars, mm -hmm. so that strengthens the correlation. So, so operate it regularly yeah. every every week, every couple of weeks, and I assume that means to to fly, right? To not fly. not just taxi it around. Because some people, yes, I know, and that's think more that harmful they... than helpful because you end up starting the engine, 
when you burn a gallon of fuel, you make a gallon of water. Mm -hmm. Most of it goes right out the breather and the exhaust system. But you put it into the crankcase, unless that crankcase is really hot, oil's hot, pistons are hot, you're all you're doing is collecting that water. You're not vaporizing it and sending it out of the engine. So it's not a good idea to, to turn the prop. It's not a good idea to start the engine and run it up for 15 minutes or whatever, or taxi around. If you're gonna start it, start it, preheat it, start it, fly it. And then uh, uh, that's much, much better for the, for, the, for the plane and for your pilot skills. Good to know, yes. Well, Mr. Cohen, thank you for spending part of your morning with me today. Uh, I learned a lot about oil and that I didn't know when I woke up this morning. <laughs> and I hope you learned something from this as well. And I uh, hope you enjoyed this conversation. See you in the next video. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Oh, mine.